Hello, everyone. We are here with Dom Dalmaso from the Logos Project. How are you doing, Dom? Hey, doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome. It's great to have you here. We're going to, to open a little series on traditionalism with uh, Dom today. Uh, hopefully, in the upcoming weeks, uh, we'll have John Salz as well, uh, Andrew Bartel, and Michael Lofton. So, we're doing a, a little series on. Uh, traditionalism, radical traditionalism, whatever you might call it. So, yeah. uh, Dom, first, first of all, uh, tell us a little, about, a little bit about you, about the Lovers Project. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, uh, my name is Dom. I run um, a YouTube show. It's also a podcast. It's called the Logos Project. You can find it on all podcasting platforms and on YouTube. Um, our main, uh, our main mission is to. Um, share with uh with the church and with uh the larger world the beauty of the catholic faith and uh and hoping that that will inform our culture and um but uh so yeah uh, traditionalism is something that came up on the radar as well especially in my channel um and uh the reason why is because i had john and andrew on to talk about the sspx and uh, so i grew up in the sspx um i transitioned uh it wasn't an abrupt transition so around the ages uh, 13, maybe 14. And then we moved uh, over to the fraternity of St. Peter. Uh, I went to one of their high schools and then I was, um, I was a monk at a uh, monastery for two years, um, from the congregation of Solem. And, uh, I left that after two years and, uh, joined the military. Um, and towards the end of my contract, I started making some, uh, Protestant friends. And so I got back into uh, theology, apologetics, asking questions like, why am I Catholic? And, uh, and that, you know, led me to um, uh, university studies and uh, where I study theology and philosophy. And the whole traditionalism thing uh, veer, veered its head back up uh, because of uh, um, discomforts that were taking place amongst friends of mine uh, and myself when it comes to certain aspects of Pope Francis's papacy. And so I decided to take a deeper dive and to uh, try to make sense of everything. And so, yeah, so we have... Uh, on our channel, uh, we we have you know a deep love of uh, of the sacred liturgy, but we also have uh, some harsh things to say to certain people for their good, not out of anger or spite or, or hatred, but but hopefully out of love. And uh, so that kind of sums up uh, my show. So awesome, awesome. And before we begin with traditionalism, um, tell us why you are Catholic or wh what are uh, some. Uh, strong ex experiences in your life uh, yeah. that made you convert to Christ. Yes. Um, it started with um, when I was uh, younger um, in boarding school. Uh, we had a lot of uh, camps, a lot of hiking in the mountains, uh, in the French Alps, um, various places in Brittany and France, um, uh, southern France, uh, just all over the, the country where we would go on long hikes and, and, uh, we had, we had mass out in, in the woods. Um, and I grew up with the 1962. That's all I've known until I was like, um, I don't know, 20, 20 years old, maybe 21. And, um, but yeah, it was just that encounter with beauty in nature. That reminds me a lot of the first chapter of St. Paul's epistle to the Romans that really kind of turned my attention towards transcendence. Like is, you know, uh, is there a God? Who are we? Why are we here? And that was a, a kind of uh, religious experience, but it was subtle and it was continuous. And um, eventually that led to uh, my entering the monastery where I had a, a, a deeper encounter with, with God and, um, and uh, really a, a love of, of the Catholic church. And that love of the church herself deepened in my studies when I began to uncover the beauty of the Catholic church. Um, and that's why I do what I do because I feel strongly about her. So, <laughs> so that's kind of in a nutshell what it is. And also in engaging with people who are not Catholics and, you know, asking myself, is it reasonable to be Catholic? You know, maybe, maybe this is just what I, what I was given as a child, but uh, my investigation led me to conclude that yes, it's reasonable. It's probably the most reasonable thing. So that's it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So let's go uh, straight to the to the topic. First of all, yes. uh, I think since this is my first video on traditionalism, we yep. will have to define it. You know, 
yeah and good good call why why it is important to talk about it because many people many people will, will, will say to me will say to me uh, you should be talking about the German bishops, you know, about modernism, about the progressives, liberals, about the mm -hmm. Pope, you know, mm -hmm. why are you talking about traditional people? Why yeah. are you talking about people who have the faith, uh, criticize yeah. them, you know, so first of all, what is uh, traditionalism or, or, or uh, radical traditionalism mm -hmm. and uh, why is it important to talk about it? Yeah, well, uh, where I'm at right now is that I see it as a spectrum. Um, you know, on, on the far side, you have the city of a contest um, who has his own interpretation of tradition. He's his own magisterium. Um, he's basically the exact same thing as a Protestant, except he also has tradition, although it's a tradition, you know, interpreted by his own personal uh, investigation. On the other side, you have... Um, uh, the, the progressive Catholic who thinks the church began in 1965 and interprets things not in light of tradition and uh, wants to see uh, women priests and uh, gay marriage and, uh, you know, uh, all the progressive push. And so you have this big spectrum. And um, it's important uh, to know certain principles in order to be faithful uh, to, to the truth. And so the, you have to start with certain principles then make your way further and further through deductions, closer and closer um, to to where it is good to be. And so I would say that the moment you have to uh, qualify your Catholicism is the moment that you're slightly off track. Uh, and so Catholicism is traditional. Now, um, can there be Catholic members or even in the hierarchy that are not being traditional? Absolutely. We see it all the time. And but can there also be members who are overly traditional? And we see this in certain priests, uh, but it's more common in, in, in lay people. But there is a lot of priests that I know that, you know, some have gone the set of a contest route. So traditionalism is a spectrum. I think that it's it's best to drop it if you want to be uh, a, a faithful, traditional Catholic. So and I really believe that to be a traditional Catholic, you can't be, um, uh, you know, traditionalist in an ideological way. Um, and so. When I when I say traditionalism, the word traditionalism, I'm speaking of people in general who have uh, an attitude of um, of um, suspicion towards the Second Vatican Council that is inconsistent with the church's history. Uh, so that councils are not perfect is across the board. And consistency shows that there's a lot of minor issues that we can have with councils across the board. But for some reason, uh, and you know the reasons are pretty apparent in history, uh, the Second Vatican Council is receiving uh, a very kind of organized suspicion from uh, people who uh, label themselves as traditionalists, and this applies as well to the promulgation of the new the, of the new Mass of Paul VI, and especially to the the modern Magisterium. And so, what happens is that uh, there seems to be a weaponizing of a certain time period. And take, taking that, that time period of the magisterium and using it against the modern magisterium. And so, but the problem with that is that if you use the magisterium to show that the magisterium is wrong, then the magisterium can be wrong and you're sawing off the branch on which you're sitting. And so that's, that's not sophisticated. It's not, it's, it's not a good answer to a crisis. And so I would say uh, traditionalism, uh, you know, as an ism in the church is one which has an inconsistent ecclesiology and we can do better than that. And uh, but, you know, with Andrew and John, we go uh, we go after, quote unquote, again, it's not because we hate them, but it's because we fear that there's a real danger here. We 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 try to call out the Society of St. Pius X on its ecclesiological inconsistencies. And it, we do this because we want them in the church in the juridical structure of the church and right now canonically speaking they're not within the juridical structure of the church and that is a danger to souls and that is important to address so yes call out the german bishops absolutely in fact i'm going to be doing more of that on my channel and i've already done some of it uh, but you call out error where there's error and you don't discriminate because what is wrong is going to take you away from the vine and the vine is only the only place where truth can be found. So do we have quibbles about a certain Pope or about a certain passage, about a certain text? You know, you have to understand that there's different theological notes. There's also different understandings, historical circumstances. This is a complex situation. And I would just say, anytime we put ourselves in a ism box, 
we're veering away from the pillar and foundation of the truth. Does that make sense, Ezekiel? For me, excellent. For me, excellent. Okay. Awesome. Good. Awesome. So, uh, well, I, we could say that uh, it's easy to identify a traditionalist because of its his re rejection of the Second Vatican II and the New Mass, right? Yes, but that's not all of them. So I, I agree. I, I know uh, good friends and good communities who accept and cherish the Second Vatican Council as well as the Magisterium of the Popes, but love the 1962 liturgy. And I, and I wholeheartedly uh, endorse that and I'm cognizant of it. But the fact of the matter is this is a minority when it comes to what we understand to be traditionalism. And in, in general, traditionalism it is, comes hand in hand with a rejection of the council to a certain degree. Um, so I, again, it's a spectrum. I'm accounting for that. So, for example, the fraternity of St. Peter accepts the council. They accept the, the magisterium of the modern popes, and they are in the juridical structure of the church. And so it's different when, for example, the Society of St. Pius X. But a certain lay member of any kind of traditionalist community might have views that don't align with what is written on paper, say, for that community. And so the danger is there even within the church. Does that make sense? I cut you off. Yeah. I'm sorry. It does. It does. Yeah. It's like a, a spiritual danger. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's a problem of vice. Yes. All right. So, Dom, uh, why don't you tell us something about your transition from the SSPX into the Catholic Church? Yeah. So, uh, my what made you change your mind? Uh, what was mm -hmm. your experience at the SSPX? Yeah, so in the Society of St. Pius X, um, so my transition away was much more just lo logistical. So it's just because we moved and uh, decisions that were being taken by my parents and not by me. Uh, but that being said, um, I was still where I was uh, when it comes to feet on the ground, the people I was surrounded with. Um, there was this attitude of suspicion towards the Second Vatican Council uh, and a sympathy for the Society of St. Pius X and an acknowledgement that uh, their condition is OK because of the circumstance and because of necessity. Uh, and so while in the society, uh, you know, as well as even not being in the society, there was always this sympathetic to their position attitude towards the society. There are allies. And there's a sense in which that's sometimes true, of course. But but what I started to realize, and this was uh, when I further got into my studies, was that um, you had an, a problem with uh, with ecclesiology, right? So the Society of St. Pius X uh, basically believes that they can be part of the Catholic Church without being part of the juridical structure of the Catholic Church, which is to go against a traditional understanding of Catholic ecclesiology, ecclesiology being the understanding of the church. And so when I started to realize that this rejection of the council and of the post-conciliar magisterium of the popes uh, entailed a separation between the teaching office of the magisterium and the tradition, capital T, as it was handed down, then that started to contradict St. Irenaeus. It started to contradict, um, uh, let's see, the uh, uh, Unam Sanctam by um, uh, Pope, uh, oof, I can't remember his name. Uh, I can't remember which pope it was, but Unam Boniface VIII, Pope Boniface VIII, right. Unam Sanctam. And, um, and just in St. Francis de Sales, Doctor of the Church, St. Robert Berlaman, Doctor of the Church. And I started to notice that the Society of St. Pius X, in order to justify its position, has come up with a modernist understanding of ecclesiology. And so in the rejection of modernism, they've merely become modernists. So, I, so then I started to question, well, did they actually reject modernism? And then I realized it's not so black and white. The narratives start, start to fall apart. Is there modernism in the church? Of course there is. That's what Pope St. Pius X said there is. There is modernism in the church. It is a problem. But when you leave the church because of modernism, you've landed right back into modernism. And so the solution isn't to leave. The solution is to understand um, how the authority of the church works. And so, and this is why Michael Lofton's um, channel, Reason in Theology, is great in explaining what are the theological notes, what can a pope, can a pope be wrong, can a council be wrong, what level of authority is this. But also, I started to step back and look at the overarching providential 
movement of the church through time and its self-understanding. And so I, I became more sympathetic towards the Second Vatican Council, as well as the magisterium of Pope St. John Paul II, and especially Pope Benedict XVI, who now has become one of my all-time favorite theologians. And so, you know, when the world doesn't, uh, doesn't fit in the way you see things, you have to be open to changing the way you see things. And that's what I did. And so I came to this realization that it was good that I had left the Society of St. Pius X, but also I couldn't be sympathetic to its position any longer. And I had to make sure that my feet were grounded on the rock within the church, even though it's a dysfunctional family, it still is the family that will eventually be incorporated into the new creation. And Mary's pure yes, right, are... Our weak yeses, our sinful yeses, will eventually be united to her pure yes. And that's why we have the Pope to protect the yes of the church so that it is not tainted and remains immaculate. So that was kind of my journey, which, which was to, fun, to realize that fundamentally what we're talking about here is ecclesiology. And the uh, Society of St. Pius X and many traditionalist Catholics, unfortunately, have a faulty ecclesiology and that is something that will be a damage to souls hence we're calling it out excellent Dom. Uh, which other inconsistencies uh, do you see in the sspx yeah so um th there's a reason why we had a council right um can we quibble about certain things about the council yes as long as you do do so consistently you know quibble about nicaea quibble about Trent, quibble about florence that's fine that being said we still need to hold that an ecumenical council cannot defect uh, on an extraordinary level but anyway i'll leave that aside so the point being is that we had a council for a reason and one of those reasons is that the church uh needed reform in certain areas and so when you reject the second vatican council those areas are not reformed. And so I saw that this was the case in the Society of St. Pius X, as well as in other um, uh, traditionalist people. Now, again, there's a difference between on paper and what people hold to. But what I saw was this, this split between um, moral theology and spiritual theology. There was a real divide where moral theology became what we call deontological, doing things because we must. So uh, we do it because we're told to. Uh, but the church called for a reintegration of spiritual theology w w that brings into the picture the gifts of the Holy Spirit and integrates them in the Beatitudes that we hear on the Sermon on the Mount. And what we have here is an understanding that morality is not merely deontological, it's teleological, which means it has an end. And that end is beatus, to be happy, it's the Beatitudes. And so we obey the moral law because it unites us to God and creates this infinite joy within that communion, right? us with God. And so there was a need for a renewal in moral theology because the manuals had kind of separated the moral sphere from the spiritual sphere and the, the gifts of the spirit. And, and it kind of misaligned the uh, purpose of, of morality. And so the council called for a renewal there. Pope St. John Paul II uh, in his encyclical... Um, Dang it, I lost it. Uh, uh, very, that's right, very Tati Splendor. He he calls for this renewal in moral theology. And so that was one area. Another area was, and this is hotly debated in certain theological circles, but again, there's a spectrum here. It's the idea of nature and grace. So um, in the manuals, there was this divide that made nature and grace uh, almost like separate spheres that were just laid on top of each other. And what that did is it, it, it posit, you know, we, we believed that man had two ends, a natural end and a supernatural end. So he could be happy without God. And so this contributed to the secularization of Christendom, where you kind of had this natural, naturalistic, atheistic, possible utopia of happiness where people could hold to religious beliefs in private and coexist. And then the gospel became meaningless. And so um, so that's part of uh, the, another issue the council sought to address. Um, but you have a spectrum here. You know, you have the, the kind of the commonly taught and uh, circulated manuals, which had this problem. But then you had great scholastics that saw that that was not good. So, for example, Father Garigo Lagrange, 
he held to man having one uh, end, which is God, but it's a duplex end due to his natural nature. Um, so the nature and the supernatural, it's it's this twofold, it's distinct, but it's but it's also, um, you know, man is led to one ultimate end. But then you also had de Lubac, who argued uh, along different lines, and de Lubac, Henri de Lubac, and Lagrange disagreed on this, and there was some tension and some debates. But at the end of the day, they distinguished nature and grace, and they affirmed that God was the end of man, and secularism is a bad idea. And then, of course, on the far progressive side, you have uh, people who confuse nature and grace and think that everything is supernatural. It's the supernaturalizing of the natural, and this is where you get relativism, and we saw this after the council. But the point is the council addressed a real issue here, and we need to be faithful to what the council says. Uh, another area um, was... Um, Mariology, understanding the Blessed Virgin Mary in in um, in harmony, in close unity with ecclesiology. Mary and the Church cannot be separated, and in in uh, in practice, she was being separated from the Church. Uh, Marian devotions were being uh, done, um, and for example, like uh, during the Mass. So this is another aspect. Liturgical renewal was important. There was a kind of ossification, a kind of uh, lack of understanding and participation in the liturgy. And so people turned to uh, private Marian devotions. And, and that's just on the practical level. But also when it comes to uh, Catholic piety, uh, Mary wasn't seen in conjunction with the church in, in the sense where Mary is the church at the source. And a proper understanding of Mary will give us a proper understanding of the church. And a proper understanding of the church will give us a proper understanding of Mary. And then we can understand Christ better and the Eucharist and how the Eucharist unites us in the church. And so and so that was one area the council addressed as well by placing the passage on the Blessed Virgin Mary within the constitution of the church, Lumen Gentium, to, to show that Mary is the, the beating heart of the church. And so that, that, that was addressed as well. Another area was uh, collegiality that needed to be addressed because Vatican I had been interrupted by the Franco-Prussian War. In Vatican I, the the uh, you know the infallibility of the Roman Pontiff and his universal jurisdiction were uh, were taught and were defended and were and will were promulgated and and uh, and but the thing is after that the council was interrupted and the whole the whole concept and, and and definition of collegiality how the bishops work together and what the relationship to the Pope and to each other is that never got addressed so the council basically finished the work of Vatican I. Uh, when it comes to the role of the bishops. And finally, another another area is, um, uh, you see this in Dei Verbum, which is the dogmatic constitution on, re uh, on, sac on divine revelation in the Second Vatican Council. Here, Dei Verbum addresses the relationship between scripture and tradition, which was left unanswered at the Council of Trent because uh, theology hadn't, uh, you know, reached a, a, a place where it could fully articulate this because it was faced with the sola scriptura problem of the Reformation. And so the Second Vatican Council, again, resolves this issue and complements Trent by explaining that sacred tradition um, is the handing down in the worship as well as in the life of the church of the one source, which is Jesus Christ himself. And so Christ is seen in scripture in, and in tradition, not as two different sources, but as two different mirrors of the same source. So that was another area. And I'll add this last one before you ask the next question, which is um, the, the whole issue around the historical critical method of interpreting scripture became a huge uh, debate, a huge, a huge question in the life of the church. And again, Dei Verbum addresses this. And I mean, none other than Joseph Ratzinger um, gives us a tremendous amount of uh, of insight and and uh, learned um, academic work, you know, and beautiful theology on understanding how we are to use the historical critical method, how we are how we ought to be critical of the historical critical method in order to be objective. In other words, he was calling for better objectivity because the historical critical method had philosophical presuppositions that were anti-biblical and so and so it, it's one of those catholic moves where we take what is good and we discard what is bad 
And so I would really recommend your audience, if you want to know more about the history of the historical critical method and the church's attitude towards it, read Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, especially his beautiful series, Jesus of Nazareth. So those are just a few things. You know, there's also the interplay between transcendence and imminence in theology. The council sought to address that. Those are just a few things of what the council sought to do. Things went off the rails after. There's no question about that. But it's not because things go off the rails that we jump ship. We have to listen to our mother and what she said, not what people are saying she said, even if they're on the ship or within the, the household. There's a reason we have a structure of authority. So I'll leave it at the head. Awesome, Dom. Awesome. One thing I wanted to ask you, you mentioned collegiality. Uh, yes. That's one yeah. of the doctrines that the SSPX the spices, you know, the SSPX mm -hmm. calls collegiality an, an heresy, heresy, mm -hmm. a direct heresy of the council. Um, they also have problems with the doctrines of ecumenism and religious liberty. As well as the mm -hmm. as well as the rejection of the new mass, so yes, you you coming from the SSPX having all these uh, ideas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, despising these doctrines, despising the new mass. Uh, how was your your transition into accepting all these doctrines? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Religious liberty was a big one, of course. There's several ways you can approach it. Um, one way you could approach it is to say that, quite frankly, it is a change. Now, I'm not saying this is my position, but some people will say, well, religious liberty, it, you know, the teaching of the council is a reversal. And so and this is where you look at the theological notes. Maybe the church, uh, on a level where it's not infallible, uh, made certain mistakes that the council corrected. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is to see a complete continuity, uh, but with a different historical context where the same principles apply in different ways. And a final way to look at it is that uh, if you differentiate between the power of the state and the power of the church, then suddenly the religious liberty of dignitatis humanae matches up perfectly with the religious liberty taught by Pope Leo XIII. And so there's many ways you can do this. There's many ways you can reconcile this. And we're called to do such, such work. And that's why Pope Benedict called for people to address this topic and to do work. Uh, on, on understanding what the council sought to say. Um, so that was for religious liberty. Uh, collegiality, um, well, especially when you see the, the, the emphasis on papal primacy in Vatican I, there's a real harmony in Vatican II in bringing up the, the doctrine of collegiality. But I mean, this is one of the most traditional doctrines of the church. It's, it's right there in the New Testament, and you see it throughout, throughout history. Sometimes it's eclipsed by the necessity of the Roman pontiff to step in to maintain unity, but it's never been uh, uh, not part of the deposit of faith. And, and this is also a great area where we can engage in dialogue with our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters. Um, and so, yeah, collegiality is simply to say that, um, you know, the Pope isn't like the one who, uh, through whom the, uh, the, um, the, what we call the munera, uh, the gifts of, of, of that, that the bishops receive in their ordination, it, they, they receive that from their ordination, not from the Pope. However, their, their ability to use those gifts licitly must be within the juridical structure, which in that law comes from the Pope. And so you have an important distinction there. And so that's important to understand why the bishops at a council aren't spectators and offering, you know, uh, opinions and the Pope saying, we'll take that, we'll take that, we'll take that. That's a no. It's not the Pope who is running the council in a certain sense. It's all of the bishops. And what they say is 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 very important and is valued and is decisive in decision making. Uh, the Pope's role is juridical and uh, but he's also a bishop among the other bishops. So, um so that, that's for collegiality. Uh, for the Novus Ordo Mise, uh, that one was big for me because, you know, I, I had never gone. I mean, I, ha I think I had gone once, uh, but I barely remember it. But I had always gone to the 1962 uh, Missal. Um, and so, you know, I heard the arguments of uh, it basically eclipses the priesthood of the minister. That's one uh, um, critique leveled at it. Another one is that it eclipses the understanding of sacrifice and of propitiation. And another one is that um, 
it uh, it, it decreases uh, belief in in the in the presence uh, of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, and finally, let's see. Uh, there's a sense in which I'm trying to remember all the critiques of the Novus Ordo. Um, let's just use those. So, so starting with the first one, uh, there was again uh, a need for reform that the council sought to bring about because there was a for, we've forgotten that lay people do participate in the priesthood in virtue of their baptism. We call this the the universal priesthood. Uh, now, the 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 minister, the sacred minister, participate in the priest participates in the priesthood of Christ in a different way because he receives an additional sacrament which places a character on his soul, a character that is not present in the baptized uh, person. And so you have a difference in priesthood. In a sense it's kind of a it's kind of a hierarchy of participation. Now it's 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 actually the Protestant metaphysics of of competition that made it possible, for after the council this confusion to take place which is that oh so now the people have a priesthood oh so the priest isn't that different because we're all priests that implies that there is no difference because when there's difference there's competition but in a catholic metaphysics there can be difference and not competition we call this participation and that is what the council sought to do to bring about a deeper participation from the faithful and for them to realize that their priesthood is active, but it's different. It's not the same as the ministerial priesthood. And so that that's when I realized that the problem was the culture, not the council. Um, and, and when it comes to um, what was the other one? Yes. The, the, the sacrificial aspect of the mass um, you see the, the, the emphasis on the sacrificial aspect. I mean, I do think we should probably uh, restore some of the old offertory. It is a shame that it's been um, kind of played down. But but here's the thing. This is a misunderstanding because the the uh, the Tridentine Mass, right, is called Tridentine for a reason. It was there before, um, but it was codified at Trent. Um, and, and you have this kind of this developing um, separation and uh, uh, one against the other attitude of Protestant versus Catholic. And so what was emphasized is the sacrificial aspect of the mass in order to safeguard, right? The truth of the doctrine of the mass against Protestantism, which is a good, beautiful, awesome, wonderful thing. But the thing is the patristic theology of sacred liturgy is, I would say fuller because it understands the mass as the expression, the representation of the Paschal mystery. This is patristic language. And the council, the second Vatican council sought to restore that older language because it's, it's uh, issues now were different from the post Trinitine issues. Now the church isn't merely seeking to, um, you know, emphasize something in order to safeguard its doctrine from Protestants, we live in a very different world where the church wants to present to the world the fullness of the Catholic faith and shifting the emphases towards something uh, more central, like, in other words, Christ himself. The, the council is Christocentric. And so it's not it's not anti-Protestant in, in a certain sense. It's not anti-Orthodox, anti-this. It's rather pro-Christ. It's Christocentric. And so those shifts in emphasis create shifts in liturgy. Because it's no longer merely the sacrifice of Christ, but it's the entirety of the Paschal mystery. And so propitiation is included in that. And in fact, propitiation is brought up in Sacrosanctum Concilium as well as in the introduction to the Missal, the Novus Ordo Mise. Now, was the Novus Ordo Mise promulgated in the way that the Council Fathers intended? You can make a good case that it wasn't. But that being said, there's a big difference between saying that the Novus Ordo Mise wasn't promulgated exactly as intended and then saying, you know, and on the opposite side saying, no, the Novus Ordo Mise contains heresies of Protestantism. It has a poison of heresy. It's a danger to your faith. It was promulgated by the church. And so if you're saying that the church can promulgate a liturgy that is harmful to souls, that is heretical, that has a poison in it then you are calling into question the indefectibility of the church according to Trent and Vatican I. And so, yeah, so that's what I would say about the Novus Ordo uh, Mise. And so it's a liturgy that um, that is not harmful to souls. Obviously, abuses are harmful to souls, but that applies to the 1962 as well. Uh, and, uh, and so, I mean, I'm really a huge proponent of Pope Benedict's reform of the reform. 
the situation is different. This is why we're talking about this because uh, Pope Francis has come down and, uh, and I've just been discovering how, uh, although, you know, I have reservations about the prudence of that decision. Uh, I, I do think that it's, it's founded on very real issues that are present in the church. So um, that's what I would say about those issues. What about ecumenism? As criticized yes. by the CPX? Yes. I mean, the well, yeah, I mean, as the church moves uh, through time, it's like a, it, she's sometimes kind of like a pendulum. You got to, the, the, you know, it, there's a saying, right? Um, semper, reformant, semper reformanda, right? So always reforming herself. The church is always reforming herself because she's always in need of reform. And so she, she veers in one direction in the name of reform, but then she needs to be kind of veered back in into the different into a different direction for the sake of reform we've never made it we haven't like okay here you know this is the climax of catholicism we've made it no and so what happened after the council is that um because prior to the council the catholicism that the catholicism that was being lived was a kind of bourgeois, apathetic, secular Catholicism of we're going through the motions, we're doing what we, what, you know, what we're supposed to do. It's this deontological thing I was talking about earlier. We forgot the teleology of ethics, and so there's there's a loss of the eschatological. There's a loss of the sense of mystery. There's a there's a real uh, increasing of secularism in the church prior to the council. And if you want to know more about this. I would read uh, uh, Joseph Ratzinger's article before the council called The New Paganism in the Church. And so what happened is that the church, right, um, had all these rules, and but people were following them for the wrong reasons. And so when the church wants to remind you, hey, we're supposed to follow rules for the right reasons. So, you know, what she did is she removed some of them, uh, kind of like taking the the – the um, what's it called when you have the bicycle the two side wheels the training wheels it's like taking the training wheels saying no 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 you you need to be able to you know uh um bike on your own and you know and have full uh, control of the the apparatus now uh there is a, a question about how prudent some of these taking the training wheels off methods were but at the end of the day the reason for doing so was so that we could mature in our faith and, and kind of let go of this apathetic, bourgeois, secular um, attitude towards Catholicism. And so what happened after the council is that everyone went crazy because there was no more guardrails. And, and so uh, false ecumenism is, is the kind of relativism that followed uh, within a secular world, which is, you know, oh, we can all get along and, you know, truth doesn't matter. And what really matters is, um, you know, that, that, that we can, uh, you know, uh, co coexist, right? And the problem with that is that you can't have genuine diversity without some kind of overarching unity. And this is why the Catholic Church does give us an answer that does not relativize truth, but that does reach out beyond itself. It isn't closed in because it has a mission. It must go out to the world. It must open the doors and reach out and dialogue and, and talk without compromising on the sacred deposit. And that's a balance that's difficult to find. It's what the church wants us to do. But the fact of the matter is the chaos after the council was caused by the rots before the council, not by the council. So. Awesome. You talked a little bit about the, the positive aspects of the numas. You yes. want to add some to, to those. And another question is, what do you like? What do you appreciate? Uh, of the three and team mass 62 yeah yeah um yeah so 1962 i'll start with that one i love the offertory um i i love the so i love the beauty of the prayers at the foot of the altar but um uh, I, for a while uh especially in the monastery we we had a mass where we didn't say the prayers at the foot of the altar and we didn't say the last gospel uh, uh, john chapter one after mass and the reason why is because, uh, well, first of all, Benedictines have a, a slightly different liturgy than uh, diocesan priests. But um, the reason why is because the prayers at the foot of the altar were usually said in history uh, in the sacristy in preparation for Mass. And the last gospel was usually said in the sacristy after Mass in, in Thanksgiving, was a prayer of Thanksgiving. And so, uh, you know, the Roman Rite has always, it's always loved simplicity and sobriety. It's part of what makes it beautiful. And so 
so anyway, that's just to say, you know, I did love those two aspects, but I do think that it's probably good for the sake of beauty and simplicity and the kind of austerity of the Roman rites that uh, those uh, are removed. Uh, and if you if people like them, they can say them uh, before and after mass as well. Uh, so but yeah, so the offertory, uh, I really love the the um, uh, the prayers, especially when the priest washes his hands, uh, the, the prayers over the gifts uh the the um prayers when the angels are uh, uh asked to intercede for us to bring our prayers up to god as the incense rises up to god uh i i really appreciate um well this is not part of the missile itself but the ad orientem right facing east is something that is uh it's an apostolic tradition i don't know why we're not doing this we should be doing that we should be facing east um i also like um I do like the repetition of the Domine non sum dignus, so you know, Lord, I am not uh, worthy. Um, but uh, uh, it was simplified. I think it's probably a good thing that it was brought back down to one. But uh, I don't know. I like repetition. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm designed to be an you know an attendee at an Eastern um, uh, liturgy. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but uh, I, I like that personally. Um, and I just, I just, I knew it by heart. That was just, I knew the text. I knew the the canon through and through. I could recite it, um, and I just you know I loved those prayers. But when it comes to the 1969, uh, I think there is an impoverishment in the in in, in the prayers. That's true. But things that are good are um, the taking out of the phrase "mysterium fidei" from the words of institution and placed um, after them, like it used to be historically, as an exclamation from the people. That's a good change. Uh, another good change is saying amen once we receive the Eucharist. And the reason why is, first of all, because this is an ancient tradition. We see it in several of the church fathers. But it's because it's it it shows forth the covenantal aspect of the sacrament. Because a sacrament is, uh, you know, the word is from Latin sacramentum. It means oath. And so it's a solemn promise, a solemn vow that God makes. And, and he does so. Um, you know, for his church. It's like the marital vow of the bridegroom. And the bride makes that solemn promise her own. And and a promise, any vow that is worth its salt, right, is enacted. It's ritualized. So this is why the spouses, they pronounce their vows at marriage, and then they say those vows with their bodies in the marital act. And so the Eucharist is to the church what the marital act is to a marriage. And so it's a solemn vow that is made concrete that God initially makes that we enter into. And so when we respond, amen, it's like saying, I do. And when you receive the Eucharist, saying amen is one of the most appropriate things you could do. So that's that's just a detail, but that's a good one that was uh, brought back. Finally, the, the the readings. Well, I would say we need more Latin in, in the Novus Ordo Mise, uh, and especially because of Gregorian chant, which cannot be sung in any language other than Latin. It wouldn't be Gregorian chant if it was sung in English. Uh, you can sing uh, chant in English, you know, but it wouldn't be Gregorian chant. And Gregorian chant is beautiful, and Sacrosanctum Concilium calls for its use, um, and we've just forgotten it. Um, but um, but yeah, so what was I saying about the Novus Ordo Mise? Yes, that's right. So uh, the readings um, should be, I think, read facing the people in the vernacular so they can understand them. But the mass, the canon, uh, should be facing east with the people towards the crucifix, towards the rising sun, towards the resurrection, the hope of the new, of the of the new, um, uh, yeah, the new arrival, the parousia, the second coming of Christ. Um, and so, in other words, both of the rites could enrich each other. Um, and so and, and, and the fact that we are now um, in a situation where that's going to be a lot more difficult uh, really saddens me and kind of angers me. I've got to be careful with that. But because there's people out there that have weaponized the 1962 against a proper Catholic ecclesiology in rejection of an ecumenical council of the magisterium of the, of the modern popes. And, and what that's done is it's punished people like me and you who who, um, you know, wish we could have all these beautiful gifts that mother church has given us. But now here we are, you know, on timeout because the brother, uh, younger brothers just can't behave. And so, um, that's how I see it. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yes. Excellent. So linked to the issue of the new mass, 
You know, the SSPX uh, has this claim that the new mass is impregnated with a, a novel theology, a new yeah. theology of mm -hmm. the Pascal mystery. You know, they say yeah. there is a new theology of the Pascal mystery uh, going on in the new mass that makes it, you know, uh, approximate to heresy or something like that. There are all of these authors of the mid uh, mid twenties, uh, you know, the Lubak, uh, Conga, Runner, you know, mm -hmm. who to whom they the SSPX will say they are all modernists, you know. Yeah. What will you, will you say to to those claims? Yeah. Well, anytime someone lumps a whole group of people under one title, I say be suspicious. That's just not how the world works. The world is much more interesting than that. And so what I would say is that the first thing to, to consider is that, is this the narrative that you had this monolithic, well-defined, um, you know, theology that was just, uh, you know, completely devoid of any kind of mistake, be it a slight mistake, be it a, a overemphasis or, you know, something that's just erroneous. No, that's never existed in the history of the church. Theology has always been a conversation between theologians, between saints, between bishops and priests and lay people. Theology is us trying to grapple with what Jesus, with what God said to us in the person of Jesus. And so um, what I would say is that, you know, sometimes we, we paint it like the, the preconciliar holy office, the neo-scholastic, you know, manualistic, uh, you know, books in the seminaries. That's that's the traditional view of the church. And then you have Rahner, Balthazar, de Lubach, Ratzinger, um, you know, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, and you just you put them all in one box here, and then you have this other thing in one box there. No, the world is way more interesting than that. And so what I would say is that you know, uh, Rahner, uh, for example, Rahner and Kungar, uh, and you know, on one side you might have, and then de Lubach and, and Balthazar on the other. They saw they did not see eye to eye. They they had some very serious disagreements um you know and there's also like what about uh you know etienne gilson and jacques maritain and uh uh service pink hairs and uh alistair mcintyre alistair mcintyre you know all these all these people are you going to say are they part of the nouvelle theologie like this this categorization is just overly simplistic the way i see it is this you had uh new questions that needed to be addressed and you could go about it in a good way, in a mediocre way, or in a lousy way. And but the church had to address them. And it's safe and and you know, and you won't make mistakes if you don't address them. But then you're 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 not responding to the mission of the church, which is a missionary zeal to spread the gospel to the world. And so I would say Rahner had some good stuff to say, but at the end of the day, he went too far and kind of created the, the genesis of progressive theology, and that's a bad idea. The church has said, no, we're not going to go in that direction. Although not everything in, in Rahner is, he's a, Rahner's brilliant, you know, he's, he, he should be read, uh, but with a grain of salt. A, a safer theologian, for example, would be uh, 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 Hans Urs von Balthasar. Some people have quibbles about one thing or dare we hope all are saved. You know, give me a break. You, you don't you don't stop reading St. Thomas Aquinas because he denied the Immaculate Conception. Right. So uh, what I would say is that, you know, um, the theology of Balthazar is 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 very patristic and very traditional. And and uh, but even safer person would be Joseph Ratzinger. His theology is uh, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's amazing. Uh, and it's been, uh, you know, behind the drafting of the uh the Constitution on Divine Revelation, Dei Verbum, uh, the theology of Pope St. John Paul II, who was also a council man, a council father, um, or, or a periti, I can't remember. But the point being is that his theology is um, addresses the, the, the new questions of our sexuality because the question of sexuality is one that was not the same 70, 80 years ago. It's much different now because it's rampant in our culture, and we need to address this um, when it comes to de Lubac, you know, he, he, his, his knowledge of the patristics and his vision and understanding and trying to bring, uh, you know, to enlarge in the, uh, scope of our, of our vision when it comes to tradition, which is a very large, uh, deposit, you know, it's not just the commentatorial Dominican, uh, tradition on St. Thomas. That's, that's a beautiful strand of it. But if we have just that, 
then we, we forget our Catholicity, right? The Catholic Church is where theology can, can flourish and not be suffocated. And so, um, you know, but you got to be careful, you know, for example, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, Skillebeck, like the, he, he went off the, the deep end, you know, Hans Kuhn just went cuckoo, completely cuckoo. So maybe, you know, you got to be careful. But at the end of the day, so you have this conversation taking place between all these different theologians. Right. And so some have great ideas like Ratzinger, wonderful ideas. Right. Some have oh, that's an interesting idea. Mm, not sure about that. And then some are like, oh, that's a really bad idea. How do we discern? How do we decipher? How do we make sense of it? Holy Mother Church. The church will say, that's good. That's good. That's not good. That's a bad idea. And how do we know? Does the church have like a list of these theologians? No, but it's the way she speaks in her documents. If you can read her properly, you realize, oh, she's endorsing this. She's endorsing that, et cetera, right? Now, it doesn't mean the church is, is perfect in how she teaches. It does mean that she's safe, though, and that we owe obedience. And that's really what I would say. So the narratives aren't simple. Anyone who puts a group of people under one title is living in a boring world. All right. And uh, another question would be... Uh... Was it difficult to change your mind about popes like John the Twenty Third, Saint uh, Paul the Sixth, Saint John Paul the Second? These popes who are, you know, uh, very attacked by the SSPX by many traditionalists. Uh, yeah. They deny their uh, canonizations. Uh, you know, they are very yeah. criticized. So, what changed your mind about them? Yeah, um, it's, so for me, it wasn't like at one point I thought Pope St. John Paul II was the Antichrist, you know, or or some kind of arch heretic. And then I had an overnight conversion. Oh, he's actually wonderful. I love him. No, for me, it was um, it was just kind of putting uh, St. John Paul II or, or, or Pope Paul VI, putting them, uh, St. Paul VI, putting them aside and asking myself, okay, is my ecclesiology right? And then digging deeper. And then coming back and realizing, oh, wait a minute, no, these are not arch heretics. They're wonderful teachers of the faith that are flawed human beings. And that's what did it for me. So it wasn't like he's awful. Oh, wait a minute. He's great because of what he said right here. No, it's like he's awful. Wait a minute. That doesn't jive with my, my ecclesiology. Let me go back and check my ecclesiology. Oh, okay. I get it now. And then I'll come back. Oh, wow. You know, St. John Paul II can really teach me about self-gifts. And about understanding the Eucharist, uh, the Church, and Mary—it's beautiful. And uh, and so it was more of that going back and checking my presuppositions, and then returning to them that made me change my mind. So, excellent. And one final question, Dom. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. You know, many many youngsters are going for the traditionalist. Uh, ways you know yeah what would you having uh, having been those ways what would you warn warn or recommend to them you know young people? yeah yeah well it depends on who i'm talking to if it's uh someone who um see because a lot of young people are upset with and i and i share this with them Uh, sometimes you know the way the liturgy is celebrated, or um, or there's just confusion that can take place in in a church made up of human of a human hierarchy. You know, uh, they want they want a safe haven, um, and it, I understand that. What I would say is um, familiarize yourself with the sacred scriptures, study scripture. So get some good commentaries on scripture that are intelligent, informed, and really you know, help you encounter the real personality of scripture. That's what did it for me really was going back to scripture and asking more fundamental questions. Is Jesus Christ a historical figure? Um, did he die and, and rise from the dead? Uh, who are the Jewish people? Yeah. So for me, it was really going back to the scriptures because what that does is that it recenters you on Christ, right? Because St. Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So for me, number one would be go back to the scriptures, pray them, study them. Number two, get a hold of some good resources 
like uh hopefully my channel the logos project but but like for example uh you know michael often's reason in theology um there's you know there's uh there's good resources out there uh uh if you're more uh nerdy and academic uh dr larry chap's blog uh godumet spez dot 20 uh, godumet spez 22 uh that's really helped me a lot um and maybe like a book like let's see a book like this one here would be helpful. It's called, um, oop, got it backwards, sorry. It's called Conciliar Octet by uh, Father Aidan Nichols. Uh, that'll help you get a better grasp of the council. Um, and at the end of the day, I would say that just make sure you're within the juridical structure of the church. That's paramount. Make sure you don't reject an ecumenical council. And, uh, and, and if you got those two down, right, and, and make sure you acknowledge the authority of the Bishop of Rome and of your own local ordinary, uh, and make sure that when you're upset, you, um, you know, you're charitable, and you, you begin by praying for the person in authority, and then you say, okay, this is what I think is not the best. Um, and also, like, uh, ask yourself, what would I do in that person's shoes, right? So, okay, but at the end of the day, the young person wants a, a place to go to mass. They want they want reverent liturgy. They want sound doctrine. Um, you know, search for all that within the confines of the juridical structure of the church. Um, and, yeah, that's it, basically. Stay home. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So yeah. where can people find you, find your work? Uh, you are in YouTube, in Spotify. Yes. So uh, any podcasting platform, uh, Apple, Spotify, uh, Google, you name it. If you just type in the Logos Project, you'll find us. Um, and of course, on YouTube, if you type in Logos Project, you'll find us. Subscribe, listen to our content. Um, and uh, if you have questions, put them in the comments. Uh, you know, we love interacting with people. And so uh, and if you want to support me, you can go to patreon.com slash the Logos Project. So that's about oh, it. <laughs> awesome. And which are the, the most uh, important issues you're covering in the channel? I, I saw yeah. you were covering uh, some uh, traditionalism issues with Andrew Bartel. Uh, what else? Yeah, so John Salza, Andrew Bartel, and myself uh, are engaged in a, in a uh, it's still developing, but in a series on the Society of St. Pius X, Um, and Andrew and I, we're, we talk about uh, traditionalism as a whole, its, its spectrum, the good in it, the, the, the sometimes bad that's found there, uh, but, and how to be a faithful Catholic and love good liturgy and stuff like that. But also, I mean, me personally, uh, with one of my co-hosts, uh, Sam, who's a, uh, he's a convert, he used to be Protestant, we just we talk a lot about the theology of Joseph Ratzinger and of John Paul II. Uh, and, uh, you know, Church Fathers, St. Thomas, Augustine, presenting the beauty of the Catholic faith to the world, uh, but also, you know, to the church again, so she can wake up, shape up, and share it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you very much, Dom. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. A pleasure. Thanks. Anytime.